<clears throat> okay, we left off on chapter 6, page 76. <clears throat> A gun blasted, and he saw the sudden dart of fire from the darkness by the fireplace. The bullet smashed into the door, and then he went in with a rush. He caught a glimpse of Sharon, her eyes wide with fright, scrambling away from the fire. Zapata lunged from the shadows, his face set in a snarl of barred teeth and gleaming eyes. His gun blasted again, <clears throat> and a bullet snatched at Rock's jacket. Bannon thumbed his gun. Zapata staggered as though struck by a blow in the stomach. As Rock started for him, he leaped for an inner door. Rock lunged after him, firing again, and there was a crash as he went through the sack-covered window. Wheeling, Rock leaped for the door and went out. Zapata's gun barked, and something laid a white-hot iron across his leg. Rock brought his gun up and turned his right side to the crouching man and fired again. Fired as though on a target range. The half-breed coughed and his pistol dropped into the mud. He clawed and agonized, he clawed with agonized fingers at the other gun, and Rock Bannon could see the front of his shirt darkening with, with pounding rain and blood. And then Bannon fired again, and the breed went down, clawing at the mud. A door slammed and there was a yell. Rock willed and saw Sharon in the doorway. I can't stop, he said. Talk to pagodas. And even as he spoke, he was running across the worn grass toward the trees. A rifle barked, then another, and then intermittent shots. Crying with fear for him, Sharon Crockett stood in the door, staring into the darkness. Lightning flared, and through the slanting rain, she caught a brief glimpse of him. A rifle flared, and then he was gone into the trees. A moment later, they heard the pounding of hooves. They'll never catch him on that horse, Tom Crockett said. He got away, Sharon turned, and her father was smiling. Yes, daughter, I'm glad he got away. I'm glad he killed that murderer. Oh, father, then his arms were around her, and, and as running feet slapped in the mud outside, he pushed the door shut. The door slammed open, and Mort Harper shoved into the room. Behind him were four men, their faces hard, their guns ready. What was he doing here? Harper demanded. That man's a killer. He's our enemy. Why would he come here? I don't know why he came, Crockett said coldly. He never had a chance to say. Zapata had been waiting for him all evening. He seemed to believe he would be here. When Bannon came in, he fired and missed. He won't miss again. Harper stared at him, his face livid and angry under the glistening dampness of the rain. You seem glad, he cried. I am, Crockett said. That Zapata was a killer, and he deserved killing. And I'm glad, Sharon said, her chin lifted. I'm glad Bannon killed him, glad that Bannon got away. There was an angry mutter from the men behind Harper, but Mort put up a restraining hand. This sounds like rebellion. Well, we'll have none of that in this camp. I've been patient with you, Sharon, but my patience is wearing thin. Who cares about your patience? Anger rose in Sharon's eyes. Your soft talk and lies won't convince us any longer. We want our oxen back tomorrow. We've had enough of this. We'll get out of here tomorrow if we have to walk. No, you won't, Harper said. Come on, boys, we'll go now. Let's teach him a lesson, boss, one man said angrily, to blazes with this paddler. Not now, Harper said. His nostrils were flared with anger, and his face was hard. Later. Then the door closed after them. Tom Crockett's face was white. Well, Sharon, he said quietly, for better or worse, there it is. Tomorrow we may have to fight. Your mother helped me fight Indians once, long ago. Could you? Sharon turned, and suddenly she smiled. Do you need to ask? No, he smiled back. And he and she could see a new light in his eyes, almost as if the killing of Zapata and the statement to Harper had made him younger, stronger. No, I don't, he repeated. You better get some sleep. I'm going to clean my rifle. This is chapter 7. 
Rock Band and Steel Dust Stallion took the trail up the canyon at a rapid clip. They might follow him, Bannon knew, and he needed all the lead he could get. Some of those men had been in, their, in these hills for quite some time. Yet if he ever got away into the wilderness around Days River, they would never find him. Shooting it out with six or seven killers was no part of his plan, and he knew the Teamsters who had come to Poplar were just that, a band of renegades recruited from the scourings of the wagon trains passing through the fort. After the immediate dash, however, he slowed down to give the still dust better footing. He turned northeast when he came out of Poplar Canyon and rode down into a deep draw that ended in a meadow. The bottom of the draw was roaring with water that had run off the mountain. But as yet it was no more than a foot deep. Far below he could hear the thunder of Day's River, roaring at full flood now. The canyon through the narrows would be a ghastly sight with its weight and thundering white water, always a turmoil. Now it would be doubled and tripled by the cloudburst. Rain slanted down, pouring unceasingly on the hills. The trail by which he had come would be useless on his return. By now the water would be too deep in the narrow canyon up which he had ridden. He must find a new trail, a way to cut back from the primitive wilderness into which he was riding, and down through the valley where Freeman had been killed and then through the mountains. Briefly he halted the big stallion in the lee of a jutting shoulder of granite where wind and rain were cast off into the flat of the valley. Knowing his horse would need every ounce of its strength, he swung down, and his shoulder against the rock, he studied the situation in his mind's eye. His first desperate fight had taken him northwest into the wild country. Had he headed south, he must soon have come out on the plains beyond the entrance to Bishop's Valley, where he would have nothing but the speed of his own horse to assist his escape. He was needed here. Now, any flight was temporary, so in returning north he had kept himself within striking distance of the enemy. His problem now was to find a way through the rugged mountain barrier ha towering thousands of feet above him into Bishop's Valley and across the valley to home. No man knew these mountains well, but Hardy Bishop knew them better than anyone else. Next to him, Rock himself knew them best, but with all his knowledge they presented a weird and unbelievable tangle of ridges, canyons, jagged crests, peaks, and chasms. chasms. At the upper end of the valley the stream roared down a gorge often 3,000 feet deep and with only the thinnest of trails along the cliffs of the Narrows. The isolated valley might have been walled for the express purpose of keeping him out, but as he ran over the possible routes in the, into the valley, one by one he had to forget them. Bailey's Creek would be a thundering torrent now, water roaring eight to ten feet deep in the narrow canyon. Trapper's Gulch would be no better, and the only other two routes would be equally impassable. Rock stared at the dark bulk of the mountain through the slanting rain. He stared at it, but could see nothing but Stygian darkness. Every branch, every rivulet, every stream would be a roaring cataract now. If, if there were a route into the valley now, it must be over the ridge. The very thought made him swallow and turn chill. He knew what those ridges and peaks were in quiet hours. They, would be, they could be traveled, and he had traveled them, but only when he could see and feel his way along. Now, with lightning crashing, under biting against, I'm sorry, now with lightning crashing, thunder biting against the cliffs, and clouds gathered around them, it would be an awesome inferno of lightning and granite, a place for no living thing. But the thought in the back of his mind kept returning. Hardy Bishop was alone. Or practically so. He had sent Red to the line cabin nearest Harper with most of the fighting men. Others were in a cabin near the Narrows and miles away. Only two men would be at home beside the cook. <laughs> Rock Bannon did not make the mistake of underestimating his enemy. Mort Harper had planned this foray with care. 
he would not have begun without a careful study of the forces to be arrayed against him. He would know how many men were at the line cabin, and the result of his figuring must certainly be to convince him that the ranch house was a load. Mm, excuse me. And Hardy Bishop, the heart, soul, and brain of the bishop's strength, was there. There was a route over the mountain. Once by day, Bannon had traveled it. He must skirt a canyon hundreds of feet deep along a path that clung like an eyebrow to the sheer face of the cliff. He must ride across the long, swelling slope of the mountain among trees and boulders, then between two peaks and angle through the forest down the opposite side. At best, it was a 12-mile ride and might stretch that a bit. Even by day, it was dangerous and slow going, and he needed only his own eyes to convince him that lightning was making a playground of the hillside now. All right, boy, he said gently to the horse. You aren't going to like this, but neither am I. He swung into the saddle and moved out into the wind. As he breasted the shoulder of granite, the wind struck him like a solid wall and the rain lashed at his garments, plucking at the fastenings of his oilskin. He turned the horse down <clears throat> the canyon that would take them to the cliff face across which he must ride. He preferred not to think of that. Drawing near, the canyon walls began to close in upon him until he became a giant chute, until it became a giant chute down which the water thundered in a mighty Niagara of sound. Great masses of water churned in an enormous maelstrom below, and the steel dust stallion snorted and shied from its roaring. Rock spoke to the horse and touched it on the shoulder. Reassured, it fell gingerly for the path and moved out. A spout of water gushing from some crack in the rock struck him like a blow, drenching him anew and making the stallion jump. He steadied the horse with a tight rein then relaxed and let the horse have its head. He could see absolutely nothing about nothing ahead of him. Thunder and rolling of gigantic shoulder of, of, I'm sorry. Thunder and the rolling of gigantic boulders reverberated down the rock walled canyon and occasional light, lightning it lit lightning lit flares that showed him glimpses of a weird nightmare of glistening rock and tumbling white water that caught the flame and hurled it in millions of tiny shafts on down the canyon. The gray walked steadily, facing the wind, but with bowed head, hesitating only occasionally to feel its way around some great rock or sudden unexpected heap of debris. The horse wind howled, the horse wind howled down the channel of rock, turning its shouting to a weird scream on corners where the pines feared, feathered, down into the passage of the wind. Battered by rain and wind, Rock Bannon bent his head and rode on. Beaten, soaked, bedraggled, with no eyes to see, only trusting to only trusting to the sure footed mountain horse and his blind instinct. Once, when the lightning lifted the whole scene, and to stark relief he glimpsed a sight that would never leave him if he lived to be a hundred. For one brief, all-encompassing moment, he saw the canyon as he never wanted to see it again. The stallion had reached a bend and for a moment hesitated to relax, straining, careful muscles. In that instant, the lightning flared. Before then, the canyon dropped steeply away like the walls of a gigantic stairway. Black, glistening walls slanted by the steel of driving rain, cut by volleys of hail and accompanied by the roar of the cataract below. Two hundred feet down, the white water roared and banked in a cul-de-sac, and the rock was a pile was a piled-up mass of foam, fifteen or twenty feet high, bulging and glistening. At each instant, wind or water ripped some of it away and shot it, churning down the fury of raging water below. Thunder roared a salvo, and the echoes responded, and the wild cliff-clinging cedar threshed madly, and the wind. He almost wore me out on that one. Thunder roared a salvo, and the echoes responded, and the wild cliff clinging cedar threshed madly in the wind as if to tear free its roots and blow away to some place of relief from the storm. 
you guys remember us? Lightning crackled and thunder drummed against the cliffs, and the scene blacked out suddenly into abysmal darkness. The steel dust moved on, rounding the round, rounding the point of the rock and starting to climb. Then, as if by a miracle, they were out of the canyon. But turning up a narrow crevice in the rock, with water rushing inches deep beneath the stallion's feet, a misstep here and they would tumble down the crevice and pitch off into the awful blackness above the water. But the stallion was steady, and suddenly they came out on the swell of the mountain slope. The lightning below was nothing compared to this. Here darkness was a series of fleeting intervals shot through the shot through with thunderbolts and each jagged streak lighted the night with a blaze from Hades. Gaunt shoulders of the mountain butted against the bulging weight of cloud and the skeleton fingers of long dead pines felt stiffly of the wind. Stunned by the storm, the stallion plodded on and rocks swayed in the saddle buffeted and hammered as they walked across that bare dead slope among the boulders pushing relentlessly against the massive wall of the wind a flash of lightning and a tree ahead detonated like a shell and bits of it flew off into space with a wild complaint of a ricocheted bullet the stub of the tree smoked sputtered with flame and went out leaving a vague smell of charred wood and brimstone a long time later Dawn felt its way over the mountains, beyond <clears throat> and behind him, and the darkness turned gray and then rose as flame climbed the peaks. Rock rode on, sudden, sodden, beaten, overburdened with weariness. The high cliffs behind him turned their dust colored, I'm sorry, their rust colored heights to jagged burst of frozen flame. But he did not notice. Weary, the stallion plodded down the last mile of slope and into the rain flattened grass of the plain. The valley was empty. Rock lifted his red-rimmed eyes and stared south. He saw no horsemen, no movement. He had beaten them. He would be home before they came, and once he was home, he could stand beside the big old man who called him son. They would face their trouble together. Let Harper come home. He would learn, or, I'm sorry, let Harper come. He would learn what fighting meant. These men were not of the same flesh or the same blood, but the response within them was the same, and the fire that shaped the steel of their natures was the same. They were men bred to the cult, bred to the law of strength, men who knew justice, but could fight to defend what was theirs and what they believed. I think we're going to hold it right there. That's uh, page 84. See you in the next one. Love you. God bless.